Testing one, two, three. Not yet. Testing one, two, three. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. It's green, but I don't, I'm not hearing myself. Oh, no, no. It's, it, this is just for the remote participants. Got it. So it's not amplifying yet. <laughs> so their ears are blowing up. <laughs> All right. Shall I, do I stand there? Right here? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry to run in the door and then begin facilitating immediately. <laughs> My name is Jenny Heyman. I'm a program manager at eCampus Ontario. Uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this meeting and to help facilitate the next session. Uh, I was studying on the train on the way in from Hamilton from another event. Um, to see the topics that we were talking about. And my list starts out with organizational structures at OERU. So which group was looking at that? Great. What would you like to report back? Apologies, we're sharing with our online audience. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, look, we... Um, we decided a few things. The first thing we decided was that, that we should maintain uh, certain organizational groups or committees. Uh, and basically, that was, there were two of those. We felt that definitely that the Council of CEOs should be maintained and also that the OER Management Committee should be maintained but reconstituted with new membership. Uh, we felt that the working groups could be reduced from six down to three, that uh, the major change there would be to collapse the curriculum, program of study, quality, and credit transfer working groups into one working group called curriculum and quality. Um, and the other working groups that would be um, essentially maintained would be technology and um, marketing and recruitment. So three only working groups. Um, the other thing we decided would, would be necessary or should, it was suggested that we establish um, a transnational advisory group, acronym TAG, um, and that uh, the TAG, the membership of TAG would be nominated by partner invitation. And these would be influential people uh, within the sector people who had a real interest in, in uh, OER and OERU, but people who had a reputation and a name, even if TAG didn't actually do anything much, um, they would be influential in terms of their membership alone. Uh, and that the, so the membership would be nominated by partner invitation, influential membership was desirable, um, and the chair of TAG would be an elected member of that group. Um, we also thought that uh, the OER management committee membership would be basically made up of the chairs of the three working groups, keeping it quite a small um, OER management committee. <coughs> and that was about as far as we went. Oh, do you want to talk about the chairs, though, recruiting their members, their own members? Oh, um, the working group chairs? Yeah. Yeah, the working group chairs would need to basically recruit their own membership, um, po quite possibly from a meeting like this. Okay, any questions? All right, not hearing questions. Um, so the next group is the marketing group. Which group was talking about that? And who would like to speak? Okay, great. Quite intense. Thank you. So we talked about um, how we want to unroll this to the market, particularly since the market doesn't really know a lot about the product Sorry. that we're selling yet. Okay. Can I take my notes? <laughs> I'm not I'm not being antisocial uh, so we talked about how to sell this product and who we want to sell it to where they are what our market is 
we sort of narrowed it down to looking at people in Commonwealth countries who speak English, who may either be looking to grow their credentials, are older adult learners, um, they may be professionals looking to grow their skills, or they may even be students who have been unable to enroll at schools in their home country. Um, we decided that maybe it makes sense to look at three countries to start, uh, just to see how it goes, see what kind of reaction we get, what kind of traffic we get on the website. Um, we're primarily thinking, since we don't have a lot of budget, that we'll look at doing um, media pitches to media outlets in these three target countries to try to get some free press. It will give us some credibility rather than having a Google ad or a banner ad, which can sometimes look like a diploma mill or something less <coughs> reputable. Um, at the same time, we have social media accounts for OERU. We think social media could probably have a big role in this. Uh, so our going forward, we'll be looking, I think, at focusing on which of these three countries we want to focus on, um, how we'll handle that social media element. We'll go back to some of the original resources that were developed in terms of the elevator pitch and some of the original briefing documents and pull that into material that we can use for our press release and our landing page. Did I miss anything in our marketing group? Anything you want to add? Great, thank you. And next up is learner support and implementing. All right, just get my notes. So we looked at um, learner support and I'll just jump ahead of my notes quick because I think one of the big questions we had is what we actually mean by learner support and defining that. Is it academic? Is it technical? Is it peer-to-peer? -peer? Is it, um, you know, students have all sorts of questions from what is a browser to how do I register to questions about the material. So some of the ideas we looked at for um, Learner Supports was a, a pay for service for existing faculty. Um, there was, I believe it was a software called Open Study. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer university network. Um, we talked about collaborating to share a course that could be sort of a segue into OERU. Um, a student cafe in, a, in this is sort of an open discussion forum and digitally where students can communicate. Uh, the unconference idea. Uh, finding local people to support learners uh, where they're at. We talked about the importance of how it can't really be a free-for-all. There's internet trolls and all sorts of people. We have to be careful. So just, it might need some structure just to uh, you know, keep it good. Uh, the study buddy idea, working one-on-one -on -one with another student. Um, we talked about it. There's an activity to connect people um, where you use a map and an activity ask questions and then you see a on the map where the students are located and then possibly they'll connect when they see if there's people close to them that are studying together. Um, we talked about the importance of giving a variety of options um, of support and really thinking again about that target audience and who we think is going to be using this. Um, a possible online chat on a website where you go in there you ask a question and there's a bunch of predetermined questions that uh, are helpful. A digital literacy course, and I believe there, we talked about there's an OERU course already that might work here. Um, again, about the variety, so some more specific ones was videos like screencastings or FAQs, and then we talked about podcasts or audio. Um, this was neat. This was a this is a, a an idea where we we get a group together and we actually look at what an experience would look like from a one star poor experience to a 10 star great experience. Start to sort of imagine what that might look like and that might help us look at what we need to do. Um, we talked just about how with our limited resources, how do we really efficiently create supports that do the most good? And so we're kind of taking a guess at the beginning, but over time, how do we refine and say, you know, these are the supports that are getting the most impact. 
Um, one idea was about um, maybe graduate students being a facilitator because it can be really hard to get teaching experience for your CV. So maybe that they might be a good um, group of people that would possibly be willing to facilitate courses and provide support. Um, just, just was again, I mentioned we were talking about what it actually means to say learner support. It's, it's, <laughs> it's varied and wide, right? Um, one thing we talked about, and this came out of this morning when we were talking about um, uh, like risks, and one idea was students spend all this time studying. How do they know they're actually ready to go somewhere and do that test? Because the stakes are high. You, you, you know, say you pay a couple hundred dollars to an institution and you fail that exam and you fall flat on your face and it could be a really disappointing experience. So some sort of support to say to students, hey, we think you're ready to go ahead and Go to, we're behind you, go and do it. Um, and we talk about the technical support again, like uh, students have issues with internet, um, browsers, you know, everyone runs into problems where Chrome doesn't work or Firefox doesn't work and how do we address those? And somebody asked about, there's, there was something called Ask OERU and it might not be monitored, but uh, on the website, actual OERU website. So we had a big list. So some proposals for action we thought about um, is working with peer-to-peer -peer university to deliver that highlighted course, um, creating a list of what services we think students actually need and what we mean by learner support, um, defining our targets or metrics, um, getting people together and going through that one to 10 star exercise, um, Looking at the existing research on MOOCs and the student experience, um, there should be, you know, in the literature, uh, information about what it was actually like. That might be a good uh, indicator. And then we talk about, me, you know, sitting down and actually mapping out economically and logistically what a pay for support or pay for tutoring service might actually look like and be viable. It could be a source of revenue for, for institutions uh, and uh, just mapping out what that might cost and what it looks like. Good. Was I loud enough? <laughs> and moving on to quality review. Thank you. Okay, so we, we had a, a wide ranging discussion here, um, mostly due to the, the very flexible nature of, uh, of the OERU. And uh, I'd invite any of my colleagues here that as I'm going through, if you want to jump in, please do. Um, so what uh, I think that what it came down to uh, was a couple of points. One was around what kind of experience does the OERU want uh, for their learners. So the idea that if we if we know what kind of experience we're, we're hoping that they have, then this can drive the type of learning design um, that, that, that can occur here. Um, also, um, there was um, a, a discussion that, that didn't reach, reach resolution, but I'd, I'd be very keen to continue this one, um, that because um, really learning and teaching we all agreed is a very intentional activity but how the learning is engaged with is one of the potential uncontrollables especially in this in this kind of an environment and uh, and we were actually discussing whether or not um, if a course meets all of the of the quality indicators can a quality course exist as such independent of the learner and uh, and we and we sort of um, had quite a quite a bit of discussion around that because uh, um, it, it kind of wandered around because all, all of us said well you know the student obviously or the learner is an integral part of this because that's who we're designing for but ultimately uh, how much does the quality course reflect on whether or not we have the student um, and also um, we, we also spoke quite a bit about the challenges that we, we have no prescribed um, learning sequence um, for, the, uh, for OERU courses. So therefore, um, we can't necessarily say that if you offer, if you break up a course and have um, X1, X2, X3, X4, that a student won't necessarily start at X1. They may decide that number three and number three alone is the one that they want to do. So it, it's then about um, quality being compartmentalized. 
Um, and I think uh, somebody here mentioned the fact as well that um, if if they have to be completely and utterly self-contained, then the potential workload for the learning designer and the author of the course also increases. Um, and the last thing that I'll, I'll leave on was that we, we also said that um, the context is absolutely everything, especially when we are talking about indicators, because there were some folk who were talking about, well, if you've got a course that is uh, very text heavy and doesn't have a lot of media elements, um, is, is that going to be flagged as, as a poor quality course? Well, it depends. Um, and I suppose that a lot, of, a lot of these kinds of discussions boil down to it depends. Um, so I suppose at the end of all of this, I'm, I'm seriously questioning why I put my hand up for this in the first <laughs> place. Um, but it, it's, kind of, it's kind of one of those great, great conversations. And I, I really wanted to say thank you to all, all of my colleagues at this table because um, the stuff that I took down here is, is really rich and valuable. I, I really hope that we can continue this after today. Cool. Maybe, on a podcast. maybe on a podcast <laughs> yes that's the other 50 weeks <laughs> thank you so much Jenny. thanks so adrian um just one request uh, the, the summary if you can just upload it on the yes, yes i was juggling many things yeah no, no. my brain went to <laughs> Nothing wrong with a legacy approach. <laughs> right, so we, we're uh, officially breaking for, no, no, this, this is Canada. What am I supposed to be saying, Erwin? Coffee. We're breaking for coffee. Um, but we're waiting for it to arrive. It should be here shortly. <laughs> <laughs>